Hello, you're about to listen to a radio program provided by the Limestone Church of Christ, located in Kingston, Ontario. Please feel free to check us out on the web at lookingunterjesus.net. Hello and welcome to today's program. My name is Tom Rainwater and we have William Stewart with us here in the studio today and it's always a pleasure to have you here, William. Glad to be here with you, Tom. We're finishing the book of James today. We've been studying in it for a few weeks and I've been encouraged by the things that are there and I think James, when he writes the book, I think there's a general context of suffering that the Christians are going through a difficult time. And uh, one of the problems to that is that the Christians aren't always reacting properly to suffering. James says, here's the attitude that you should have. In James 1 and verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And patience has been a key word in our study, William. Here, James is telling the Christians that, yes, your faith is being tested, but you can grow through this and God can see you through. Unfortunately, some of the Christians were not reacting properly to the suffering and the temptations. Some were turning against each other. Some were speaking evil of one another. Some were showing prejudice. James deals with those things and the sins of the tongue. And there are some brethren who are turning back to the world and following riches. And there are just some in the group that are just discouraged and, and are weary. And in our last program, we talked about that. And James gives us the solution to weariness and suffering. And so when we look at our verses today, James 5 verses 19 and 20, James talks about those who have left the faith and left Jesus Christ. That's exactly right, Tom. And those verses read, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We're talking about folks who perhaps have gone through some of the struggles that you mentioned and didn't make it. And so he identifies them as some who have wandered from the truth. They're no longer being faithful Christians. They're no longer assembling with the saints, perhaps. They've turned back to the world in some fashion. They've given up on faith. And so we need to understand that these ones... They're not a lost cause. They may be lost at the moment, but they're not, they're not a lost cause. We need to seek these ones. And that's what he encourages in, in these two verses. Exactly, William. And James has spoken all along about how we should encourage one another. And we talked in the last program about, is anyone among you sick, spiritually sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And here he tells them, bring other people to you. Call people to you, other Christians who are leaders in the church, and let them encourage you in what's good. Confess your sins to one another, and we we need to be able to feel that we can trust other Christians so that we can open up to one another, because that support is needed. We need each other. We always have the Lord. He's always there. But it's always helpful to have other people that we know care for us. And in that context of helping one another, As you mentioned, William, James says, if one of our brethren has left the faith, see to their needs, go to them, bring them back, because we love them, we care for their soul. Now, Tom, there's a number of reasons why someone might wander from the faith, and in the introduction to today's program, you mentioned some of the things in the book of James that may have been a discouragement, some things that were uh, a trouble to some of the brethren. But I want us to look at some other things as well because there are reasons that perhaps James hasn't dealt with which would cause someone to wander from the truth, which would cause somebody to go into unfaithfulness. And one of those things which is mentioned time and time again in the New Testament is false doctrine, that perhaps they have been taught wrongly on some issue or wrongly on a variety of issues and led away in regard to doctrine. James hasn't dealt with doctrine, really. He's dealt with the practical side of Christian living, but he hasn't dealt with doctrinal issues per se. But in 1 Timothy and chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and at verse 20, Paul is, is warning Timothy about those who might fall astray, those who might be led astray. He says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, 
avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, by professing it some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. And so he gives Timothy this warning that false doctrine has that ability to cause people to stray from the faith. That some may be lost because of, of doctrines that are taught which are not in accordance with the will of God. And again in Second Timothy chapter 2 and at verse 18, we'll start at verse 17, it talks about their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. It's a given that false teachers are not walking in the faith, are not walking upright and, and according to the truth. But we need to understand that false teachers can draw others away. And so when James is talking about those who have wandered from the truth, False doctrine could be one of those things that would lead someone away from the truth into error and thus leave them lost. And so we need to, to seek opportunity to bring them back. Yes, that's right, William. And I think it's important to emphasize the danger of false doctrine because as Paul does it in those passages that you read, John also does that in Second John verse 9. And John, the Apostle John there says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. Now that is a serious statement. If we're not abiding, if we're not staying within the doctrine of Christ as revealed in the Bible, we don't have God. We don't have a relationship with Him. And that indeed is a dangerous thing. He continues that he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So if we're following the Bible, we have a relationship with the Father and with the Son. So that relationship which is so important, which has to do with our salvation, is dependent upon us following the words of Jesus Christ. Not straying from it, not following after something that's different, but sticking to God's words. Tom, a few weeks ago when we were studying the book of James, we were in the latter part of chapter 4, the first part of chapter 5. And in that text, we saw a, a lot of emphasis on riches. There were some who were becoming rich by mistreating others. There were some who were so concerned about riches that uh, will go to such and such a place, spend a year or two there and buy and sell and make a profit. Their focus was upon riches. Mm -hmm. And riches can be something that will draw us away from the Lord, that will cause us to be those that, that James talks about here in verse 19 of chapter 5, who have wandered from the truth. In 1 Timothy and chapter 6, again, this time at verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, recall when James was writing about these individuals, chapter 5 and verse 1, he said, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupt and your garments are moth-eaten. The, the ideas that James is bringing forth are, are the very same as what the Apostle Paul is saying. These who have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. James is talking about their sorrows. Perhaps these individuals aren't experiencing it yet. Perhaps they're experiencing the high of, of having these riches and, and all the good things that they can enjoy because they have these riches. But James is, is foretelling what the riches will bring. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. And so we need to be cautious about riches. Riches can draw us away from the Lord. Right, and the problem with riches is that we tend to be dependent on riches. We have a lot of money. We think we've got it made. We don't need God now because we can do it ourselves. And uh, that is so wrong because uh, guess who's given us the riches in the first place? God has. He's blessed us with everything that we have. And so always be dependent upon God because our riches can be taken away and we can't take our riches with us when we die. Now, Tom, we've, we've been talking about things that may draw us away from the Lord, that may cause us to wander from the truth, and, and yet there are some in the religious world who don't believe it's possible to wander from the truth. Either we're of the truth and always will be of the truth, or we never were of the truth. And so it might help us and might help our listeners as well 
to consider some examples that are in Scripture of people who at one time were walking in the truth and were led away. And we need to understand when James says this and when we read texts that the Apostle Paul had written and texts which were written by the Apostle John as well, that they're not giving scenarios that could not or did not or would not happen. They're talking about real things that happen to real people and that people who once were obedient to the will of God strayed from that, turned away from the Lord. And and so it may be helpful to look at a few examples of that. If we look over in 1 Timothy in chapter 1 and at verse 18, again, we've read from Timothy before and, and Paul charging Timothy to hold fast to, to that which is given to him. At 1 Timothy 1 and at verse 18, Paul writes, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, that some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of which are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, as much as he is encouraging Timothy to hold fast to the faith, he then gives Timothy an example and says, well, look at Hymenius and Alexander. These are two individuals who have rejected the faith. They have made their faith shipwrecked. That means that at one time they were sailing a smooth course in their faith. And yet, because of some doctrinal issue, because of blasphemy, as, as verse 20 points out, they've made shipwreck their faith. And so Paul says, I have delivered them to Satan, that they may, may learn not to blaspheme. They were once property of the Lord, and still are, but are corrupt property at this point. In Second Timothy chapter 2, at verse 16, the apostle writes, But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Uh, Hymenius seemed to have been a, a rather busy character so far as false doctrine and, and leading people astray. First him with Alexander and first Timothy, and now here's a man Philetus along with Hymenius. But notice again, they have strayed concerning the truth. You can't stray from something that you've never been with. They've strayed away. They've turned away from the truth. And he says they also overthrow the faith of some. And so they cause others to stray or others to fall away when it comes to the faith. Yes, and we can lose our faith. And the popular doctrine that we hear a lot, once saved, always saved, is not true according to the Bible. Those words, once saved, always saved, are not there. The Bible teaches the very opposite. And your example there shows that, that here we have people who lost their faith. Let me give you another one. I want to talk about Demas. In Colossians chapter 4 and in verse 14, we learn that when Paul is in prison and riding the brethren at Colossae, apparently Demas is with him along with Luke. And Paul makes a simple statement there in Colossians 4.14, Luke the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So Demas is right along there with him. About the same time, Paul writes a letter to Philemon. In the book of Philemon, and in verse 23 and 24, at the close, he mentions some people that are with him. And Paul says that Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. So about Demas, he's there to help Paul. He is called a fellow laborer. He's one of the spiritual workers there. However, later on, when Paul writes Timothy in the second epistle, in 2 Timothy, and in chapter 4 and in verses 9 and 10, he says this. He tells Timothy, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. So Paul, in talking about Demas, says, Well, he used to be my fellow laborer, we saw that there in Philemon. But here in Timothy, Demas has forsaken the Lord. He's left. He's gone back into worldliness. And Paul is very concerned for him and disappointed with him. Demas is an example of somebody who was in the faith and left the faith. 
So yes, it is possible to leave the faith. Oh, and another example, William, is in the same epistle here in Second Timothy in chapter 1 and verse 15. Not only did Demas turn away from Paul, but also Phygelus and Hermogenes. Second Timothy 1 verse 15, This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So there were several that were at Rome with Paul who decided because of whatever reason, because of worldliness, maybe on Demas' part, uh, maybe they were discouraged, maybe they saw that there was persecution for standing up for Christ, they decided to leave the faith and they put their soul in great jeopardy. That's right, Tom. Now, it can be discouraging if we just left our conversation here because we've been talking about people departing the faith, people running shipwreck with their faith, people turning from the truth. But James doesn't leave it at that. He says, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. There's a need for us then to be out there turning people who've turned from the faith back to the faith. And it's encouraging that it's possible to turn back to the faith. That if we have gone astray, the Lord's willing to take us back if we'll come back. And it's our job as faithful Christians to go and to help others to come back. To be watchful for them and and look for opportunities to encourage people to come back and to serve the Lord as they ought to. Whenever I think of that responsibility, I'm caused to think of some words that the Lord spoke to Ezekiel. Uh, In Ezekiel chapter 3 and at verse 17 beginning, the Lord has come to Ezekiel and spoken. He says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from the wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, And I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because you did not give him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning. Also you will have delivered your soul. In that text... If we're to take that and apply it to our situation today, we need to warn those who have never come to the Lord of the error of their way, of their wickedness, and draw them to the Lord in obedience to the gospel. But those who have departed from the Lord, the righteous man who turns from his righteousness, we need to go and call that one back. And we have that responsibility. And notice, in both cases... Ezekiel was told, if you go and warn, then you've delivered your own soul. But if you don't do so, then I will require his blood at your hands. And we have that kind of responsibility also, to go and to be watchful for our brethren, to to be watchful for those who are in the world who, who have not come to the Lord, to always take the gospel message forth and to help others to understand it and to be obedient to it. Yes, God commands us, William, to put forth the effort. We have to make the effort. If we care about people in that way, we're going to do that. If a a brother strays away from the faith, is uh, overcome by sin, and we say, well, he's gone. I don't care about him. So what? We're not showing love at all. Uh, What if Jesus had said that about us, that he wasn't willing to come die for us because he didn't care about us? Uh, We'd be in big trouble. We need to show the same kind of love and concern that Jesus showed for us. He was willing to give his life for his brethren. Are we willing to do the same? And another thing we need to talk about, William, is how we approach someone who has fallen away. I think that is so important, and I think this is neglected a lot of time, that Christians really don't watch carefully how they talk to people. In Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 1, Paul there tells us exactly how we ought to approach someone, the attitude that we should have in talking to them. He says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, 
You who are spiritual, restore such a one. So he says, you make the effort. You try and restore them. Now, they won't always want to. They have their own free will and may decide not to, but we have to make the effort. You restore such a one. Try to do that in a spirit of gentleness. That's how we're to approach them. We're not to approach them angry. We're not to approach them in self-righteousness and say, well, I can't believe that you left the faith. I'm ashamed of you. No, that's not going to provoke a good response. Be gentle with them. Be kind. Of course, we need to point out where they've erred and how they can come back to Christ. But if we approach them with the wrong attitude, it may turn them away even farther. So he says, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. We need to approach people as we would want people to approach us. But he says, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So when we approach somebody, we have to watch out about our own attitude, our own words, because we could be tempted to do wrong in what we say to them and how we say it to them. This is so important. Souls are at stake. Let's approach them in a loving attitude. And while we're looking at Galatians 6, William, look at verse 2. He tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We had said before in James that we need each other so much. We need to help each other so much in the spiritual life. And the burden bearing that he talks about here is in the context of sin. Our brother may need help. He may need us to help him with his burdens, help him overcome whatever he is doing that is wrong. So when we are in that situation and we need help, that he'll come to us. We need to help each other out. And in doing so, we fulfill the law of Christ, which means that if we don't help each other out spiritually, we're not fulfilling the law of Christ. We're acting outside his law. Yeah, that's exactly right, Tom. And as we again look back in James chapter 5 and at verse 19 and 20, we've seen that one has wandered from the truth, that we're charged with the responsibility of turning that one back to the Lord And that if we're successful in so doing, verse 20 says, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. We're talking about spiritual life and spiritual death. And we're talking about the importance of a soul here. We need to understand as the children of God that one of the reasons we have been saved is to help save others. And so when we see an opportunity to help a a brother or a sister in Christ who has has drifted away, we need to take hold of that opportunity and use compassion as we approach them, but certainly approach them and try and help them to come to the Lord. Uh, And the same thing when we uh, have opportunity to speak with those who have never known the Lord. Uh, We need to use compassion and teach them the gospel message. Souls are at stake. In Proverbs chapter 11 and at verse 30, Proverbs 11 and verse 30, the writer says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. It's a wise thing for us to do. It's it's what God wants us to do. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, He talked about how he had become all things to all men. At verse 22, he says, To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul understood the importance of a soul. He did whatever he could in order to affect the salvation of a soul. And so you and I, when we see one who has fallen from the faith, We need to do whatever we're able to do in order to help that one to come back to the faith. It is our purpose to affect the saving of souls. And so if we arm our minds with that thought that this life is only temporary, that the things here are here for now and then they'll be gone, but that souls are eternal, we'll approach those who are outside of Christ, whether it be that they've fallen away or have never been in Christ, we'll approach them with love and compassion and with, with sincere desire to help them and, and to save a soul. Yes, William, that's right. Good comments there. And I, I want to notice the very end of verse 20 here. When he says here in verse 20, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. There is forgiveness in Christ. 
and when we turn back to Christ in repentance, even after we've been in Christ before and strayed away, He's ready and willing to forgive us, and that forgiveness will be complete. He can cover a multitude of sins. Those sins will be gone. The Lord will move those sins out of His sight to where He will never hold them against us anymore in judgment. Yes, Tom, and... I was looking at a few texts that also use that phrase of covering a multitude of sins. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8 talks about it. It says, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And the source of that is coming from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 10 and at verse 12, it says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. He's not saying that if we just love, then sin disappears, but that because we're motivated by love and we'll help one another with love, then the Lord's going to forgive the sins when one turns back from the air of his way. And this idea of the uh, multitude of sins being covered in Proverbs chapter 10 as well, at verse 2, it says, Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. And again in chapter 11 of the book of Proverbs, and at verse 4, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. When we will love someone and show them the air of their way, and they turn back to the way of righteousness, then their sins are removed, the penalty of sin, which is death, is removed. And again, remember in James 5 and verse 20, he said that when we turn one from the air of their way, we will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And so what a wonderful thing to know that God is willing to forgive and that God will use us as the instruments to cause somebody to come to repentance. And so we ought to be motivated to help. We ought to be motivated to go out and and to teach others and to encourage others to turn their lives to the Lord. And thus, William, we come to an end here in the book of James. And James is writing this letter because he cares deeply about these people that he's teaching. He knows that Jesus has died for their sins and that there's so much that God has to offer, that God is indeed very compassionate and merciful. God has provided the way through Christ that we can come to Him and have the hope of eternal life. And this wonderful blessing of forgiveness is how James chooses to end the epistle. And it's the most wonderful blessing that we can possibly have. Being forgiven, we can have that eternal fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that's why we're on the radio. We want to bring you the gospel. We want to tell you about Christ and what He has to offer. And we want to warn you about the danger of being outside of Christ. Yes, Tom, that's absolutely right. And and to those who are listening, we would love for you to give us a call so that we can study together, so that we can benefit from looking at God's Word and putting it into practice in our lives. Won't you call the number that's at the end of our program? Thanks for listening, and have a great day. (laughs) 